right. So we're just recording. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Great. Okay. So I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today because in our initial conversation, you started bringing up some really interesting perspectives and ideas for the work that we're doing now with students online. So I just am so excited to tape this and share this with professionals who are grappling with similar, you know, problems and, and uh, you know, solutions, if you will, or ideas, as I like to call them. I like to call them just ideas. Yes. This out, right? Yeah. So I'd love for you just to introduce yourself and then I'll do the same and then we'll get into it. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for inviting me to chat. Um, my name is Becky Lewin. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I have a small private practice, um, but I've also felt really fortunate that I've had the opportunity to um, consult with different schools in New York City, uh, provide uh, trainings to educators, other professionals, parents um, around the work that occup occupational therapists do, um, specifically around you know differences in sensory processing, how that impacts um, how that impacts children, especially their experience in the classroom, their experience at home, and what we can take um, from that to then sort of improve access to all the other things that we want kids to be doing. So I would say that's sort of um, the, the focus of my work. That sounds amazing. And similarly, I also have a practice. I work within a company that I founded called Evolved Education. And we work on the academic side of things. So we work with students around their learning, especially for students who perhaps have some challenges with learning. We also help families find schools and help parents with the work of supporting their kids in school. So I'm so excited to learn from you and some of the things that you've been thinking about. And I've also been thinking about a good amount of learning theory and just how we can apply the things that we already do that mm -hmm. are really working with our kids into this mode of tele, tele support, if you will. Yes. Right? So um, I've been thinking about it since kind of day one. How can mm -hmm. I do this well? I'm always interested in really making an impact. And then when I see something working, I just want to share it with everyone. So mm -hmm. hopefully it will help jumpstart what they can do with their kids too. So absolutely. What tell me a little bit about your process of how you started moving yourself online and what that was like for you. Um, such a great question because I think as we were all professionally trying to move ourselves online, we were also personally trying to manage our own lives. So I should also mention I have two little little ones um, as well. So I think it was um, you know everyone was trying to kind of work all aspects of their lives. Um, when I, you know, I started by just letting my families know that I was available and that this was going to be sort of a learning experience for both of us. Um, I think it's really important. It was really important for me to give my families uh, permission uh, to, to continue online learning but, or uh, remote therapy, but also know that it was okay if they needed to kind of take time. Right. I think, giving, you know, the educators as therapists, we can really help give families permission to pump the, pump the brakes, especially as everything was kind of coming on, you know, everything was changing so quickly. Mm. Um, so I made myself available, but also felt it was important to give space and to give parents permission to take that space if they needed it as sort of things fell out. Um, and then I sort of, um, you know, got myself set up and I did sort of, I kind of worked it kind of two ways. I thought, okay, some of this is going to be right, like trial and error. I'm going to just start trying things and we're going to see what happens. And after each session, being really mindful to take time and space to think about what worked there, what didn't work there. Um, so creating that space for self-reflection, but then also going back to sort of theory. What do I know about child development? What do I know about um, sensory processing? What do I know about you know the autonomic nervous system and, our, and, and our, our, our whole nervous system in terms of setting ourselves and children up for success? And how can I go back to that and then bring that to screen-based interactions? Because I really think at the heart of this, um, I was sort of faced, we were all faced with the challenge of how do I continue relationships through the screen? 
right? Um, for you know, those of us who work with children, we work in education, um, it's not how we're used to building relationships. So, you know, the big problem, you know, for me a few weeks ago and kind of continues to always be at the forefront of my mind is how do I keep and maintain relationships through this new format? Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of kind of uh, the two ways I was thinking about this. Again, lots of trial and error, going with what was working, letting go of what wasn't, um, and then also just really thinking about, okay, what do we know about the theory uh, from our own profession? Um, for my profession that will help me kind of continue to inch forward. Yeah, like I can very much relate to that because I feel similar in that I kept thinking about what what really already works with what I'm what I'm actually doing with my kids. And then how can I basically mm -hmm. take the technology and give access in a meaningful way to students. And I really learned like some things early on, like for instance, when I'm teaching students in real time, I can rely on what I'm seeing them do. And I can mm -hmm. make, I make adjustments very quickly and I pivot very quickly if I see them going in one way versus the other way. So mm -hmm. I really realized I had to get the kids to be active on the screen and to like deliver to me their understanding of what I was trying to communicate to them so that I could have that information. So I had to yeah. teach my students how to do those things, which I hadn't really considered until I failed at one point in pivoting and assuming a student knew something, right? So you're talking yeah. about some really important concepts that I think we teachers actually, I mean, when you and I were having our initial call before having this conversation, I remember we were talking about being new practitioners, right? Like yes. being a special educator or you being a, you know, an OT. And and just the fact that when we were in that space, it was very natural for us just to have this feeling of, I don't really know what I'm doing, but people are telling me to do this or yes. people are urging me to do this. I'm just going to do it, even though it feels really uncomfortable. And we were often in that position. And then we get later, you know, further along in our careers and things just become easier and they just do. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like right now I'm about a month or so into this way of teaching, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. And I, I do feel more comfortable. It's been a really yeah. huge learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm like, oh, okay, we're getting here. Like kids are learning. This is great. Um, but I do feel like I'm still very, very vulnerable in this yeah. space of I've got to be really open and I've got to adjust. And I was watching a webinar I did maybe couple days out of this quarantine announcement, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, Oh, I don't know. I might, I might say that differently now. Like, yeah. you know, can you relate? Absolutely. And right. I think, you know, as going back to that feeling of being a new grad, a new professional, you know, when you've been doing this for so many years, you build up this, you know, incredible bank of experience and, you know, we don't have that bank of experience for this kind of learning. So you are, you don't have sort of sometimes those like go-to strategies or perhaps you don't go to those go-to strategies because you're not sure how you're going to implement it. You don't have that almost like even like that motor memory of like, this is how I do this dance. This is how I solve this problem. It, it, everything I think is a lot more um, laborious in that sense because it's just not necessarily at your fingertips all the time. Sometimes something will just happen spontaneously and you'll have that like, that moment of like, it's clicking, it's coming together. But I, I do think it takes a lot of practice, just like any, you know, any profession does. There's the studying of the, you know, the theory, but then there's like, I just got to get in there and, and do this. Yeah. Um, so can, you, can you talk about, can you talk about a little bit of that? Cause I know like you have definitely delved into some theories that you've really, that have become real anchors for you in this work. And yeah, I wanted so, to know more about that. Yeah. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, development and how we just build relationships with children. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's been, you know, whether I was working with a child on, you know, handwriting or fine motor strengthening or, mm -hmm. you know, visual perceptual skills or, you know, whatever the skill area was, I, I sort of had to take a step back and say, okay, you know, I have to have the relationship there because if I don't have the relationship there, I'm not going to be able to work as dynamically, as robustly on the skill, if at all, right? Like we've got kids like bounce, you know, just 
dodging the screen. Um, so we really have to understand, we have to take the time to understand, you know, why is that happening? How can I start building in the relationship? So if I think about much younger children, how would I start with a relationship building and possibly starting there? Um, so I was thinking a lot about, you know, attachment and how I'm forming relationships, how am I getting that back and forth reciprocal play? Um, even if that means going kind of younger, right? Thinking about how do we get that play with, you know, how do I start that play with like a 12 month old, an 18 month old, a 24 month old? How does that journey start? And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about that, just that back and forth, you go, I go. And, and how can that, what does that look like on a computer screen? Um, with games as simple as something like, you know, hide and seek, peekaboo, right? So if a kid leaves the screen, is that an opportunity for, I'm gone and I'm back, I'm gone and I'm back. How can I begin that dance of you go, I go? And that begins to build tolerance for visual. Con you know, I gaze through the screen, looking at each other, um, that reciprocity we need, you take a turn, I take a turn. So I sort of ran with that. And at first I had to explain to sort of parents, wait, you're playing peekaboo with my, you know, <laughs> four-year-old, like, mm -hmm. where are we going with this? Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, not skipping that step has helped me build a stronger foundation mm -hmm. with my older children. And again, it might not be like exactly what peekaboo is maybe with a very small young child, but, you know, read what they're giving you. You know, I've, I had kids just leaving the screen. And when I ran with that, I saw, oh, we're really learning how to look at each other this way. Mm -hmm or that's what we're learning. That's what we're figuring out right now. Let's go with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if I take 10 minutes to do that play, ah, now we're available for the next part of our, our session, our time together. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that, just development, development of relationships. But, you know, I've also been thinking a lot about um, polyvagal theory and, you know, what that teaches us in terms of our ability to um, read sort of danger in our environment. And, and basically, you know, in, we could do a whole thing on, we could do weeks on polyvagal theory, but, sure. but we won't, um, right now, <laughs> but, um, basically it's our body's way of interpreting, um, danger in our environment and also safety, mm -hmm. right? So when we're safe, um, and this is a very simplistic way of looking at the theory, but when we're safe, we're able to use, you know, our highest thinking skills, right? We can plan, we can sequence, we can create, we can be flexible, we can access other people. We can, we sort of go to what we call our social engagement system. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to be with people. When we're not feeling safe, we go to, we kind of drop down the ladder, we can think of it. And we use these other systems. You might've heard of your fight or flight system. Mm -hmm even further down the ladder, we even have something called a shutdown system. Mm -hmm. So as we feel less safe, we go sort of down this ladder and you can even think about it for yourself. As you go down the ladder, you have less skills. Mm -hmm. So I really started thinking about this because not only are some of our kids down the ladder, some of the adults are down this ladder, right? This is not something that is just for, this is not just in children. This is in all of us as mammals. We all have these systems that sort of take over. Um, it's not cognitive. It's not, you know, you don't have cognitive control over it. It's not volitional. You can't think your way out of it. It's a visceral body-based response. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important to understand. It is not something I can always think my way out of. It's sort of, this is happening to my body. So again, um, we can only get to those sort of frontal brain skills when we're in that social engagement state. And when we're perceiving danger, we drop down that ladder. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, for many of us, we're feeling that in a very palpable way. Uh, you know, maybe that, maybe it's a familiar feeling, but for some of us, it's a new feeling. And at, for the adults, once you start kind of dropping down the ladder, you yourself are not as equipped to be present for other people, for the children you're working with. Um, 
And again, it's, it's not um, something we can control, but I really had to think about that in terms of how do I get myself into that safe and social space mm -hmm. so that I'm more available for the kids that I work with? Because as we're all, you know, figuring out the Zoom lesson and trying to, you know, we're, you can, right? What are some of the feelings that come up? You can kind of, maybe your heart starts racing. Maybe you start to get a little sweaty. Maybe you start to get really frustrated and agitated and, irritable, right? That's all of those body cues saying, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dropping down the ladder. And when we know from our work in the classroom and, or, you know, in session, right? In person session, um, we know that, you know, we have to, we're co-regulating with each other all the time, right? So if we think about co-regulation in the classroom, our ability to help children, kind of find that safe and social mode, it's no different through the screen. We still have to be the co-regulators here. Um, and now we have to do that through the screen. Um, so, you know, in the work I'm doing now, a lot of it is working with parents, working with myself, working with, ed how do we get ourselves to that safe and social state mm. before the session, during the session to then help the kids meet us there, um, right. if that makes any sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I sort of um, can relate to that in that when I'm teaching students now, we're often remediating reading or writing. Mm -hmm. These are areas where a student is struggling and not feeling great about what they're doing within that work. And so often a child will avoid the work or, or try to maneuver out of it. And so in the screen, work, what I've been trying to do is really lay a foundation of what you're calling. I mean, a lot of this is, I didn't know the name for it all, but I definitely instinctually knew I had to set the climate. So I'm trained in yeah. something called SRSD writing, which does have a regulatory component mm -hmm. to it. And in the teaching, the teacher is encouraged to set a climate of encouragement and really mm -hmm. to communicate the power of writing and why we're writing and to uh, you know, have positivity around the experience because it's yeah. really your true voice coming out. Often these messages are fuddled up in, in, in a lot of the curriculums that we teach where we're sort of demanding children write about a topic, which I know there's a purpose for that, but it's often really emphasized and then children lose sight of, of the real sort of authentic version of writing, which is to share what's in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so... I was working with one student who was a reluctant writer and reader, and we decided to play a game together on the computer just to give some experience around the content that we'd be reading about. But what actually happened was the student sort of let down yeah. the bar and started to have fun mm -hmm. and then was excited to see me every day. And yeah. it became really special. And something I just you know, connected to as you were talking was um, my daughter is in a first grade class and mm. her teachers often greet the children with music mm -hmm. or something kind of funny to look at. Like they'll, you know, they'll be dressed up or they're going to yeah. do spirit week or something. And it really causes like my daughter to be excited mm -hmm. about turning on that yeah. computer because she can't wait to see what's going to happen when she does. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think from what you're saying, you know, many of us professionals, I think could have many ideas of what we mm -hmm. could be doing with our kids yeah. to um, enact what you're talking about, which is really this component of of um, of connection and, yeah. and ease and regulation around how we're feeling. And um, I also liked the idea of what you said about parenting and how your work now does involve more of the teaching around. Mm -hmm what parents can be doing. Do you feel as though now that you're doing more of this type of distance work that those conversations are different in ways that we wouldn't expect? Like for example, I would expect the content to be different because we're going through a pandemic. So I'm sure everyone yeah. talks about different things, but do you find that you know, are you, are you talking about things that you perhaps wouldn't have been talking about before? I'm just curious. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a great question. And I think in some ways, some converse, sometimes um, 
in some ways the conversations feel familiar, but in other ways they feel very different. And I think what's most interesting is for parents who are doing now either trying to support the school-based learning, they're seeing their child in a learning, through that learning lens or that school mm -hmm. lens mm -hmm. that perhaps was maybe one layer, one step removed. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say they're seeing their child at their truest selves because this obviously isn't the classroom, right? We're in our homes. But I think that they are seeing um, perhaps, you know, some of their successes in, able, in their ability to access learning and also some of those challenges and some of that maybe is coming more to the forefront. And I mean, the biggest thing that I, I'm working right now with mostly um, younger kids, but, you know, one of the biggest things that's coming up is, you know, just sort of being stillness in front of the screen. How do I get my kid to sit in front of the screen? Um, which is a good question. Um, and what, know, what, do you, what do you say to that? What do you say well, when they say that? I kind of, you know, there's a lot of education and I think this is, you know, goes back to the polybagel theory of, you know, if I'm in a fight or flight state, those are states of mobilization, right? I want to mobilize. I either want to run away, that's the flight, or I want to fight, right? So that's like, our bodies are getting ready to, to mobilize, to do. So if I'm coming to the screen in a mobilized state, of course I'm going to want to move. Stillness is really hard to achieve. To have stillness, we have to be able to go to that social engagement system, right? I have to be able to like still my body to a certain degree. I have to be able mm -hmm. to, you know, look you in the eye more or less, you know, of course our eye gaze can go in other places, but you know, there's certain, <laughs> you know, pieces that we sort of expect from that dance. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to do that dance, if not impossible, if I'm in a mobilized fight or flight state. Mm -hmm. So I really try to, you know, I try to create, give that lens just so that there's a, another layer of understanding of what could be happening right now, right? Like, mm -hmm what's going on? They're kind of bouncing around. They're really happy. You know, are they feeling mobilized? Are they feeling, are they perceiving danger? And again, the perception of danger is, um, is as real as, as real danger. I, you know, we, we both know that they're not in physical danger by sitting in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. Um, but if there's a perceived danger that is as real to our body as, as an actual threat. So I think that's important to distinguish, to, to remember sure. um, and to not bring sort of judgment to. It's not really up to me to decide what a child perceives as dangerous or threatening. It is sort of whatever it is. It's my job then to, you know, help them move through that and come join me. Sure. In sort of that social so engagement state. Is that sort of the, um, that's my next question is, is mm -hmm. there anything, is there anything wrong like, let's say, would we assume if a child isn't arriving at the screen, do we assume that they're dysregulated? Is that the way to say it? Or yes. are we sort of also assuming that they're just, they're not engaged or is it sort of a mixture of both? What would you say I think that? it could be Am I understanding I think, that right? Well, I think it's, you know, really good to get, you know, some information from, you know, this is when talking to mom, dad, caregiver is going to be so important. You know, what's going on before, right? There's so many ways we can help a child come to the screen. Mm -hmm. um, that can start with just sort of scheduling. Are we, you know, and again, I don't, this is not to schedule every minute of your child's day. That's going to drive any parent or caregiver a little nuts, mm -hmm. but do they have a sense of the rhythm and arc of their day? Do they have a sense of what, you know, is coming? You know, our nervous systems like predictability. We like to know what's expected. Mm -hmm. um, so do they even know that they're having, a, do they know when their Zoom classes are? Do they know, you know, do they know what day it, you know, are they, is there any time helping them orient to the time, the schedule, what, what's expected during the day, right? reason. I do not recommend scheduling every minute of your child's day. Right. Sure. So, so definitely creating that rhythm to their day, I think is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think also getting information from mom, from mom, dad, caregiver, you know, is it, they're like doing Legos and then like five seconds before the zoom session with Becky, it's like, put away your Legos, go to your zoom session. Like what's happening there. Right. Are we taking, so thinking about the transition to the class, right or to the therapy session. What's that look like? Were they, were they given enough prep, enough time? Um, were we thinking mindfully perhaps about the activity that came before? So if I were doing sort of more like a reading or math kind of um, activity, 
uh, if, if I were an educator, perhaps if it's been hard for the child to come to the computer, talking to mom and dad about, you know, well, what's kind of happening before that? Is it a movement based activity? Is it, mm -hmm. or is it more screen based learning or is it a snack or is it really thinking mindfully about not just the activity itself, but what comes before the activity, right? And I know, you know, educators and teachers can think about when they're creating the whole school day, but when you're not creating the whole school day, that it might be, you know, if you're having a hard time, that might be interesting to investigate, right? What's happening before yeah. the, the activity, even what's happening after the activity, just so you can have like kind of the, the full picture, because um, you're sort of missing, like, you're like in like if you think about the screen as the as the time, like you're missing like all the other things that kind of happen outside of that. So I think, and I'm a really big fan of, you know, when I think about an intervention, I think about, you know, how can I change the environment, right? That's like the first thing I look at. Mm -hmm. Then I think about what can I change in myself? Mm -hmm. And then I think about what can I change in the child? Like, mm -hmm. so I go sort of like most macro to my, to, I think about, because really the best case scenario is not asking the kid to change anything, right? Like you do sure. you and I'll do, we'll I'll, adapt I'll, around you. Yeah, yeah, I'll adapt around mm -hmm. you. So if I yeah. think like, okay, environment, structure, flow of the day. Okay. Now we're in our session. I think me, what can I do mm -hmm. to help bring you to mm -hmm. maybe a less mobilized state? And we can talk about the things I can do. Sure. And then I think you, okay, what could, maybe there's a tool I can give you. Maybe there's you know, a position I could ask you to sit in mm -hmm. that speaks more to your body that, you know, so I, that's kind of how I think about my intervention. And in so of, helpful. I really like that. I, I love thinking macro. I was giving some parents some advice about, you know, how to kind of think about teaching their kids. And I said, to me, thinking macro is really helpful. If I mm -hmm. start thinking about their writing and reading and spelling and all the words they know and this and yeah. that and the other, it becomes overwhelming even to me. And so if Absolutely. I think instead of, you know, I gave these three large learning buckets, I said, you know, think about perspective taking, think about um, yeah. communication, think about connectiveness and purpose and, you know, try to just work on those buckets and yeah. then we'll trickle down into the stuff that we teach in school. But exactly. Um, you know, and I, I also work with many teachers and I'm working on a piece now that's talking about just, you know, right now teachers have a lot of work that they're doing within these smaller buckets as well. And just maybe mm. thinking about some macro concepts to help alleviate their brains yeah. a little bit. I think that, you know, we also are dealing with a large learning curve, all of us, mm -hmm. everyone in the world right now is, and some of that's very inspiring. I think it's actually yeah. really interesting to look at because if you take a step back, you can see that it's pushing many of us into places that mm -hmm. we've never really been in. And that actually does historically cause societies to evolve and move. And it's, it, is, it is a positive in many ways. Um, but for our, our children who are really concrete and yeah. really used to a smaller existence and world, I think it becomes ever, ever more important for the yeah. adults in our lives, you know, in their lives to construct what you're talking about, which is, you know, that structure and then to mm. be reflective on the structure. Yeah. You know, for my children who are online for most of the day, we have very strict guidelines on when they are allowed to be on the, the computers for mm. fun. Even talking with their friends on FaceTime mm. is included in that because they need to do the bigger body movement. They need yeah. to build with their Legos in their hands. They need yeah. to dribble the ball for basketball. And if you don't have that time in, you know, in, involved in the day, it's very difficult. Yeah. And I think schools now have a really nice opportunity to connect with families in ways they never have before to really help them in that, that partnership, you know, way so that they can learn, the parents can learn the benefit of yeah. these kinds of things, right? They don't, they don't know all of the lessons that we teach, right? And reading and right. Reading math and all of that, but, but, you know, certainly parents can be tasked with arranging. Yeah. The and I, things. you know, yeah. I love what you're saying about, you know, thinking Mac, you know, yeah. for my families that we know, maybe the reason they came to see me was more for fine motor or gross motor. But, you know, I just had a conversation with um, a family the other day 
and you know that that child's not available for that sort of kind of like you know smaller bucket or more sort of like tailored work so we just started talking about what brought the child joy um they were talking about you know he's in a big pirate kick right now and i said great you know get out the you know paper towel roles have a sword fight like you're gonna get all that gross motor play you're gonna get you know balance and crossing midline and you're gonna you're gonna get all that stuff it's all gonna come um don't worry about the home exercise program that's right. not you know like just <laughs> let it go like right. you right. know play a great game of pirate you'll get there you'll yes. get to the work that needs to be done i think now is a really fabulous time to talk with each other you know yeah. and just kind of get at what's interesting and what's what's actually driving your curiosities i know for me it's been a pleasure to do that in work where i'm able to sort of spend some of my day now writing and creating content yeah. that's interesting for me and i find it to be very motivating during this time and very settling and i think for children it is the same not different however we as educators often are operating and really through no fault of our own because you know we have systems in place and we have yeah. laws and we have we have a lot of top down structure sort of telling us what to do and yeah. if we can break through up from that which i really hope that even just that comment that mm -hmm. i just said right now is inspiring to someone listening you know yeah. break through all of that um, it, you know it, there's a potential now to really mm -hmm. understand where your student is coming from and grab hold of something to extract mm -hmm. to connect with like you were saying in the very beginning like if you can grab into you know grab onto something that is exciting yeah and you're or, you're already winning right like yeah. you're you're going to be able to teach them something right absolutely so, and yeah. you know i think just going back also a little bit, you know, so thinking about like, right, that environment really, you know, scheduling, big picture stuff, the space, you know, thinking about those things, you know, then thinking about what you can do as the provider, the teacher, you know, things that we know. And again, this goes back to what we know from polyvagal theory. There are things we can do as people mm -hmm. um, that help bring kids to either stay in a more so safe and social state or help bring bring them to a safe and social state. So things that I'm doing right now are, um, you know, I'm, I'm going really slow. I think when we're, we're talking through Zoom, I've talked to a lot of people about this. Our tendency is to like speed up. Our tendency is to yell. Um, so, you know, totally. when, you, so, you know, step one I find is go slow. And when you think you're going slow, go even slower, because that's probably not slow enough. Slow yourself down slow your speech down, slow your movements down, right? We know that quick moving things sometimes can be cues from, a, from you know, if we think of ourselves as animals, right? Think, think cavemen, think animals, right? That can be, those can be perceived as cues of dangers. So slowing ourselves down, our speech, our movements, mm -hmm. just slowing it all down. The other thing we can do is we can use a really um, prosodic or sing-songy voice. We know that as humans, we tune into and read sort of a sing-songy quality in our voices as safe. Um, so we tune into that and we were intrigued by that. Sort of lower, more muted, more flatted um, tones of voice can be perceived as, as a danger cue. Um, so that's something, you know, I'm always really mindful, even with my older kids, just making sure I'm, you know, maybe not singing, I'm not singing to them, but just kind of keeping that quality in my voice. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if I feel like I kind of maybe lost them for a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing we can do is just sort of keeping like a softness around our eyes, keeping sort of our, our facial expression bright and sort of filled with affect. We don't want to go sort of like blunted or sort of too neutral because that can also be perceived as sort of cues um, of danger or sort of like what is that you know I can't read that person um, I would never sort of demand eye contact mm -hmm. um, I find that even when I'm in a session with a child that I don't really demand eye contact that can be really threatening um, but there are some sort of fun games you can play with finding eye contact, whether it's things like peekaboo, or I've been doing games where I'll put like silly stickers. This is for your younger kids, but put, put silly stickers on my face and we'll like, you know, go one, two, three, and then show each other where we put our stickers and we hide them again, just as like a warm up to like kind of get used to looking at each other through the screen. Um, lots of like follow the leader stuff. So again, maybe with your 
you're younger, even some of your older kids starting with some Play-Doh, putty, something that they can be molding in their hands where you're sort of following each other's movements, sort of squishing it, passing it back and forward. You take a turn being the leader, then they can sort of guide you through some exercises, but just sort of gentle things to ease into the relationship and of sort of the relationship on the screen and, and giving, again, especially kids who might be in a more mobilized state, something to be doing so that they can sort of discharge that energy, if you will, but while we're staying together, if that makes sense. So I don't have to like leave you to get the energy out. I can stay with you and we can sort of discharge that together while I kind of come down and realize, okay, this is a safe and this is a safe space and sure. I'm not going to, and, and I'm with someone who um, gets that and is meeting me where I'm at. So I'm curious, once you're sort of there in that state and you're, you're feeling really relaxed, um, so what is it that you feel comes next in terms of the instruction? Like, let's say you are working on fine motor and typically mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're physically adjusting a student, right? Or let's say you're yeah. working on the, um, you know, just sort of the the, the body regulation that comes mm -hmm. from packing and, you know, swinging. I mean, are those things lost at this point or are you, are you needing at those points to partner with someone on the other side for those areas? Yeah. I'm just kind of wondering what that looks like. It depends on, it really yeah. depends on um, the child, the child's age, the child's, you know, ability to, you know, follow simple directions over the computer. And sometimes even, you know, you'll meet, you know, some kids like, they're the kids that kind of will leave the, the, the screen where it is. And then they're the kids who take you for a tour around their house. So, um, <laughs> you know, and you get the house tour. So I think it's really child specific, but what I like to do once I've gotten kids into sort of that, okay, we're, we're together is the bulk of my, the focus on my work right now has been, is there something I can introduce now that then mom, dad, or caregiver can use throughout the day. So teaching a lot, you know, I do a lot of, um, breathing activities, blowing, acti you know, breathing, making bubbles um, to get sort of deep breathing. And again, we know that deep breathing helps us bring us back out of our mobilized state into a more sort of social, um, safe and social state. So a lot of deep breathing. Um, I'm really trying to model um, for parents this idea of like big gross motor play in the house mm -hmm. um, with stuff that they have. So couch cushions, pillows, blankets, um, sort of fun gross motor play. And then not only can we have that play, we can get all that excitement, but then how do we kind of ramp down from that? Because I think one of the things that gross motor play in the house gets is sort of a bad reputation for, okay, we do it. It's really fun. And then I've got kids like ricocheting off the walls and, um, you know, it gets kind of too big and then it can't be sort of contained after that. Mm -hmm. Um, so spending some time with parents, if they're available to be in the session to see, okay, we can do, you know, this really crazy game with these pillows and then we can clean it up and come back, come back to sort of, um, bring the arousal all the way down. So really working with kids on the arousal, you know, thinking about that arousal arc or, you know, going up, getting excited during all that rough and tumble play. And then we can bring it back down. And then you can go to your math lesson or whatever comes next. And, and that's hard. And I, I suspect that for some parents, that's the reason why there is, um, they're not always, you know, always doing it in their house. It's hard to know how to like kind of close the activity. For um, sure. For that's sure. hard and tricky yeah. for parents. Yes, and people, I understand and, that. I yeah. feel like that's really something that I didn't realize, I mean, with my own children, when they were doing even, you know, OT as young children, or, you know, they're older now, I just felt a sense of um, gratitude, you know, for bringing them like to the sensory gym to yeah. kind of take care of all of that stuff, right? Yeah. For me. And then I would pick them up. But I imagine actually there's a benefit now, again, there, going on the, you know, the positives of all of this. There is. In actuality, something that in tutoring, at least there have, there has been, um, an addition of asynchronous learning opportunities mm -hmm. for, for kids to be engaged in, in between lessons. And this is a huge positive and it's mm -hmm. really going to help a lot of kids to make more progress. I think the teachers yeah. and tutors are getting more comfortable with it. So I imagine in your work, there's this, right. It's becoming more helpful because yeah. you're having that true, you know, meaningful partnership you know, that, that is helpful. Yeah. To have, and right? I think, yeah. 
And I think it goes back to, it's, you know, I have the luxury and the privilege of working out of a, a sensory gym, you know, before all of this, um, mm-hmm. that was, that's beautiful and has incredible equipment. And I'm so grateful for all that equipment, but I've also worked in facilities where, you know, you're in a hallway and, you know, it really, when you're stripped of all your, of uh, that stuff, you know, it does force a different kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. And I do think it brings it back to, you know, at the end of the day, you and you're the plaything, right? Like we want to be the thing of interest, the, the caregiver, the person, right? Because that's where the back and forth comes in. And that has to be there for learning. <laughs> like yeah. if that's not there, um, we really can't learn or we can't right. learn as, ro- we can't learn as robustly or as dynamically. It sort of, it, it closes that, you know, the way that we sort of teach and learn in this society, you know, which is sort of like back and forth. So sure. um, I do think it forces us to think about like, so how do I become the thing of interest? And it pushes us out of our comfort zone. It makes us think super creatively. Um, and I think it gives parents, you know, um, some opportunities for really incredible play with their kids, you know, real, and for parents sure. are getting super creative and, you know, finding all sorts of things in their homes. And, um, and that's a huge sort of natural high, right? That oxytocin flowing, that, that, you know, that cuddle, that feeling of wanting to cuddle and snuggle with your kids, regardless of their age. Um, the, that those hormones being released, that's really powerful stuff that, you know, can happen with, uh, some couch cushions. Right, right, right. Exactly. Not the so, same. <laughs> you know, so. Not the same, yeah. So just to like kind of sum up, uh, all of this good, amazing, amazing, just experience and advice and everything. I think that, you know, we've, that we've kind of brought to light, hopefully through our conversation. I'm just wondering if we could each share some key takeaways mm. for others in our profession that we've gathered in, in our process at this point, yeah. like just any, any, it could, you know, could be any, any topic, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the big takeaways and the thing I kind of hold on to again is thinking like, you know, thinking, thinking big in terms of, um, you know, think environment and think you, how can you change yourself? And then think about maybe what the child could could change or modify. But um, I think the more we can we can take on that work as parents as adults, that then translates in a much sort of smoother way to the child, and in a way that they're sort of more receptive. And we're sort of thinking really broadly. Since you know we're thinking about all those big pieces that go in um, to sort of create a child's experience, and then at the very end, I'm asking a child, okay what do I need to ask you to possibly do differently or try? Um, And realize that when we're asking a child, a child to try something new, that, that can be scary for them. So if I can, you know, kind of hold that request off till I've taken care of everything else, I think that's going to really help, um, help our children kind of stay in that safe and social uh, state for longer. And I think then the, you know, the other thing I would say is um, play find ways to play with your, with, with your child, with the children you're working with, even if that means the lesson gets put on the, you know, the back burner for a little bit, I think we will be creating a much stronger foundation for um, screen-based learning. And, you know, we, we don't know how this is going to kind of go. There could be, you know, a scenario where we have to revisit screen-based learning, right? So I think, taking this opportunity to create a foundation of relationship building through screen, through the screen is worth it so that we then have learners who are equipped to, you know, hopefully they won't have to, but should they have to come back to the screen, they have that foundation of how I, how I share space, thoughts, ideas, um, emotions with someone in this format. So I think taking our time to really do that as professionals is is really important as opposed to maybe the shortcuts to you do 30 minutes, you get a cookie, you, right. And I, and you get the sticker, you get the TV time, which, you know, I get, and I don't knock and every family has to do what works for them. But if we think about it from another way of, you know, how do I teach a child how to have a relationship this way? Mm -hmm. I think that will, you know, have longer lasting effects. I love that. And from an education standpoint, I feel like 
my takeaways would be to engage with the entire system around the Mm -hmm. child. So, you know, in special education, we're often building teams around children. And so just making sure that everyone is communicating what's going on and sort of how everyone's experiencing the child. And just to have that holistic picture, as you talked about earlier, around what's happening before the session and leading up to the session and getting that real holistic viewpoint in working with families. And I also think that The other takeaway that I feel like I'm really working on with administrators that I support and, you know, teachers that I support is just helping them to partner well with their families and Mm -hmm. helping them understand this potential of really teaching the family to function in a way that allows a child to continue to learn Mm -hmm. um, is very, very, is a huge takeaway. Yeah. And you know, sort of lastly is just the engagement piece and how crucial it is for a child to feel connected to the content in some way or to the skill in some way or to be asked how they want to study something or what do they want to study or what are their curiosities and having, like you were saying, and it's not really any different, but just following you know, their lead around Mm -hmm. some of that, you know, you know, early childhood, there's a lot of talk around a Reggio concept, you know, the concept of learning around Reggio Emilio and just the fact that that sort of leaves for some reason getting into elementary and middle school. I don't necessarily think it needs to. I think a lot of times our kids are really, really wonderful leaders of their own brains. And so if we can just work on being patient and like you said, slowing down and learning about who this child is, who is on the other side of the screen, right? Yeah. And having that that ability to connect in a meaningful way to them, right. really a powerful situation. And I would love to see this engagement happen beyond a pandemic yeah. too, to do a few things. One is to give us all more connective experiences with each other, even though we're not in the same geographic region. That's mm-hmm. number one, right? And we also, f- I feel like the collaboration that can come around discussions on a call even like this is it has a lot of potential to affect a lot of people so um, our children I hope as they grow will have more and more experiences using technology without losing yeah. pieces of learning and experience of their development that we know they need so much yeah um, so those are some takeaways that I've been kind of working with but yeah Absolutely. I love that. And I, you know, follow, like you said, like follow their lead, follow their lead, follow that like sparkle in their eye. Like mm-hmm. that's when you know, totally. you know, the s- neurons are firing and circ- you know, things are coming together. When, when you lose that sparkle, um, you might be on your lesson, but you've lost something else. So this, I feel like the sparkle has to be there. And we all know that, that feeling of when a kid is really connected to you and, and what you're doing. It's yeah. like the best. And, so. and for the administrators who are watching this, I think, you know, our, our power as administrators is to really provide our educators with that power of yeah. being able to read the room and adjust. Yes. And giving them permission to do so. And I think it's a, it's 100%. often lost in our leadership of education to do that because of all the other things that are happening. Yeah. Right? Like, but right now, especially is the time to just get on that phone call. I encouraged a bunch of administrators last week just to make a little Zoom video and say, guys, we're, we're working a little differently. This is what I yeah. want to see from you. A, I give you permission to change up what you're doing if you see it's not working. B, I give yeah. you permission to connect with your kids in ways that you know you're in the driver's seat, you know your kids best, go for it. You know, And giving them permission to solve problems. Listen, if you get this feedback, you're allowed to respond with that. Yeah. Message, you know, And empowering others in this in this world right now is there's a lot of potential for that and i think that our educators are the kind of people that want to serve and they want to help and they have really creative amazing brains and so again going on the same notion as we're doing with our kids right if you're an administrator you can certainly tap into who you're connecting with mm-hmm. connect with them uh, through the screen and teach them how to use this to their benefit my favorite times of teaching have been when I'm working on a lesson or something I think is so meaningful with the kid and the kid asks me a question that 
just derails us, you know? Yeah. Or when I was a classroom teacher in teaching math, they would ask a question about a math concept and I'd say, oh, you know, you guys should kind of know about that. Like, let's get let's into do, it. Let's you know? do that. <laughs> yeah. We should so, do that. Let's do that. It, yeah. And those are, love those are some of my favorite yeah. moments of teaching, right? And I, and I think that, par- you know, we can do so much education with parents, with yeah. teachers where that is, that is the most important type of learning, right? Like the, that, that is such important type of what that that's important learning. So I think, you know, helping again, using this time to goes back to what we were talking about framing for parents. Well, why am I playing hide and go seek with your seven year old? Here's all the reasons why hide and go seek is such a, you know, fun filled, you know, packed activity with all sorts of skills that we could talk about on and on and on, you know, so really helping you know, parents, the, the grownups in the, in the room, whoever those grownups are, see, you know, why these things have such tremendous value. Yeah. And, you know, you know, what we're, you know, again, the theory behind that this, there's, there's all this incredible stuff that lets us know that this is, you know, the work we need to be doing. I love but, that. Um, I love that. Well, it's so, this is such a great conversation. Yes. I feel like we could probably talk for hours about probably. all of the I think. <laughs> Great. So how can professionals reach you if they want to talk with you further? How would that Yeah, happen? they can shoot me an email um, at rrlewin, so r-r-l-e-w-i-n at gmail.com. Uh, you can shoot me an email. I'd be happy to, you know, uh, I'll get back to you. So I, I'm, I used to say 24 hours, but, you know, given everything, I just now say 48 hours because I yeah. do have two little Fair ones. Enough. But, um, and we're all working from home, but please reach out to me with your questions, things that made sense, things that you, you know, maybe disagree with. And I think that's really important to, you know, hear those parts too, so that we can all kind of, you know, bring our brains together and, um, adjust and, you know, learn from each other. And so please, I welcome questions, um, ideas, things that have worked, things that backfire. So. Yeah. It's all about that really. I mean, yeah. for me too, I love that. And you can reach me of course at evolvedead.com, but also my email is mary at evolvedead.com. And we will place this video on our YouTube channel. And in the notes section, I'll put Becky's email address as Great. well as mine. So we can always make sure everyone can dialogue with us around all of this. So I really look forward to that. Absolutely. And I know Becky, you do too, because yes. it's all about really collaboration and learning and making sure that we're really connecting well with that little being, you know, across the screen, across the wires and the waves. Absolutely. (laughs) It's all about that. It's what we love to do. We live for it. I live for it. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to hit pause on the record. Thank you.